Somehow, a two-year-old boy walked 12 miles in 19 hours through very, very rugged Oregon terrain, and he did it in the winter. The event took place on April 10th and 11th in 1952, and it was on a remote cattle ranch in Ritter, Oregon. The cattle ranch was about 270 miles southeast of Portland, Oregon, near the Umatilla National Forest. And the cattle ranch wasn't like your normal cattle ranch. It was not a prairie in an open field where the cows would just be seen grazing. It was a very hilly, rocky terrain, and the ranch sat at the base of thousand foot bluffs, and there was a river that ran through one side of it. And on that day, Edna Parkins would be visiting her parents who owned the property. Uh, Edna would be visiting with her husband, Alan, and their three kids. Edna would later say in interviews that the ground was kind of patchy, snow covered. It was spring was on its way, but it wasn't quite there yet. And it was still pretty cold outside. Around noon on April 10th, Edna was making lunch for her children while they were outside looking at a freshly birthed calf that was at the barn. The barn was only a few hundred feet from the house, so she felt pretty safe letting her boys out there to play. And when she was done putting together the lunch, Edna called out to the barn for the boys to come on down. And just a few minutes later, the two oldest boys would come running through the door and Edna would ask them, where's Keith, your youngest brother? And they said that Keith took the long way around the barn and he was on his way. When Edna went to the front door and she didn't see Keith running to the house, she was concerned. So her and the other two boys went back out to the barn. And when they got inside, they found the footprints of Keith, but they didn't see him anywhere. So they walked around the outside of the building, but they didn't find his footprints anywhere outside. So this really made Edna very concerned and they started looking farther and farther away from the building. After about an hour's worth of looking in that local area, Edna would run back and call the police and start to get a search team together to try to figure out where her son had gone. The response to her rescue was amazing. More than 200 people showed up, and although they were not official rescuers, they knew the area very well, and so they set up this, uh, what's called an effective sweep width, which would mean that everybody was within earshot of each other, and they could cover as much ground as effectively possible, while still trying to figure out where the boy was at. A few hours into the search and they found some small footprints very similar to what Keith would be wearing on that day. And it was about three miles to the northeast of where the barn was. And it was inside of this kind of cattle enclosure that was encircled with barbed wire. It seemed very odd for his feet to be in that cattle pasture, but they found his footprints in a patch of snow and there was no other area for his footprints to go into the snow. It was just, as if somebody had taken his two shoes and stepped him in that snow in that one location. And if Keith did walk to this cattle pasture, it would already be impressive. It was three miles in a straight direction, which was bizarre for somebody of his age. And the time that he did it in would mean that he would be moving at about one mile an hour through very rugged terrain. It seemed absolutely bizarre that he would be in that location. The team continued to search all night through the frigid cold. It was actually below freezing that night, which made the team very concerned that Keith would be able to survive the night. But the following day at 7 a.m. on April 11th, they found Keith. He was face down near a frozen pond, but where they found him is bizarre. He was five miles to the west of where the pasture was, the same pasture that they found his footprints in, which means that Keith would have had to have walked from the barn three miles to the northeast to this pasture where his feet footprints were found, and then five miles to the west where he would eventually be discovered. And Keith was stiff from the cold, he couldn't move, but they ended up picking him up and airlifting him to a hospital where he would make a full recovery. When it was all said and done, if Keith did travel this straight line, he would have walked from the barn to the pasture and then to this pond covering nearly 12 miles in a straight line. And when he was found, he was holding his hat and his jacket in his hands which means that he survived the night most likely not wearing them in the sub-freezing temperatures. Beyond just holding his hat and jacket though, Keith was found with his face and his hands and his feet were badly scratched and the clothing that was underneath where his jacket would be was also torn. Now, rescuers at the time attributed that to the barbed wire that he had to crawl through to get to the pasture. And there were several other locations of barbed wire as well. So. They attributed it as just that uh, he crossed through some barbed wire and it cut him up a little bit. Now, when rescuers asked Keith how he got scratched, he said, a cat scratched me. 
which this is a two-year-old, so that could mean that either a literal cat scratched him, or maybe the barbed wire felt like a cat scratching him, or maybe he just saw a cat that night and attributed the scratch to it, or he just made the whole thing up. There are a lot of oddities with this story that we will most likely never know, but, but some of the questions that I have are, how did he survive all night long over 19 hours from noon on the 10th to 7 a.m. the following day in sub-freezing temperatures, potentially without his jacket on? Something else should have been keeping him warm. Also, why weren't there any tracks around the barn when uh, Edna first went out there to look for him? If it was freshly snow covered or even just a light dusting of snow, there should have been a track walking out in one direction or another. Later on, Les Stroud, who's Survivor Man, would go on to walk Keith's path, and he concluded that given the terrain and the elevation changes, there should have been absolutely no way that anyone could complete this trek, let alone a two-year-old. Tell me below in the comments what your theory is on how Keith disappeared. Jennifer's phone rang and it was her husband. His voice though sounded frantic and scared. He said that two men were following him on the river. They were only about 20 feet back and neither man responded when he yelled out to them. And just before the call ended, he said that he was going to get off the river and he was just gonna walk instead to get away from these guys. Then the line went blank. These are the words of a man whom only a few hours earlier was enjoying a relaxing Memorial Day weekend with his wife, his uh, son and three month old daughter. His in-laws were also there and they were at a family cabin in the Baldwin River area of Western Michigan. Cullen played football his entire life and coaches would say that he had amazing natural ability. Cullen then went on to win three Division II national championships while in college. Unfortunately though, his college success would not translate into professional success as Cullen bounced around the NFL from the Baltimore Ravens to the Denver Broncos before eventually leaving the league and playing in Austria and finally for the Muskegon Thunder, which is an indoor football team, before he finally hung up the sport for good. Years removed though from football, Cullen hadn't played in four or five years, and on this day they were enjoying their Memorial Day weekend and they were starting off the last day of their family vacation. Cullen was the first one to wake up that morning and he started off by feeding his newborn daughter and then he went down to the pier to do a little fishing. At around noon that day, he made himself a mixed drink and he had a few more beers throughout the afternoon. By 5 p.m., he was feeling tired and he would eventually head inside to take a two hour nap. From about 7 to 8 p.m., he woke up and he had a cup of coffee Nothing out of the ordinary, but he did tell everybody that he wanted to have one more fishing trip before the vacation ended. So he got his gear together, they made a plan, and everybody was in on the plan. They knew exactly what was gonna happen. Uh, his wife, Jennifer, would take him down to the river, and his father-in-law and brother-in-law would pick him up about 30 minutes downstream. Cullen was in a floating pontoon where he would just float with the river's current. Less than 30 minutes after dropping him off though, Jennifer would receive a flurry of phone calls from him. He sounded scared and disoriented. He spoke of men that were following him on the river and in the woods. Jennifer told him, just don't move. We're gonna come and find you, just stay where you're at. So his family scrambled, they got into their cars and drove out to the river where he should be at. And on one of the phone calls that Jennifer had received, he actually told her his exact iPhone locations. And when they arrived there, he wasn't there. Worried about where Cullen might have disappeared to, his wife called the police and the deputy would arrive within an hour and the official search and rescue had started. Cullen was very well versed in the outdoors and he spent most of his life hunting and fishing. And the area that he was lost in was described by locals as, you cannot walk 15 minutes in any direction without hitting a road or some sort of civilization. It was a very populated region. Police would go on to use his cell phone information to triangulate his location. And this is where things got very strange because his signal from his cell phone showed that he was five miles north of where the river that he was supposed to be fishing was. And then after just a few minutes, they tested the triangulation again and found that he was eight miles south. Police didn't know what to make of this information and just chalked it up to false readings. His alma mater, which was Grand Valley State University, heard of Cullen going missing and they put together a request for locals to help out and try to figure out where he was at. So what they did is they loaded up multiple buses full of people and drove about three hours north to the Baldwin area. And all told, several hundred volunteers would search within a one mile radius 
over two days looking for where Cullen was at. On the second day, Cullen would be found, but it was bizarre how he was found. Uh, it wasn't five miles north and it wasn't eight miles south, but it was within a quarter mile of the river that he should have been found at initially, well within the search area. He was found face down and he was dead in an area already searched many, many times by rescuers. Cullen's death confused everyone. The weather wasn't bad, it wasn't cold, and he had plenty of clothing on. He had just eaten before going out on the trip. There were no markings on his body to indicate trauma or asphyxiation. And when the first autopsy was received, they couldn't identify what killed him. The longer this case went without having an official cause of death, the more speculation started to swirl about what happened. Uh, some people attributed it to football injuries, such as CTE. Uh, some others said heart attack, or when they found him, there was vomit throw up in the area that he was at. So some people thought that maybe he choked on it or asphyxiated on it. But when his second autopsy was completed, they were able to rule out all of the above. His football injuries were so minor that they most likely played no role in his death. Doctors also found that there were no indications of a heart attack. There were no damaged tissues or anything like that that would generally indicate that something had happened to his heart. Uh, the vomit that was found near him was never in his lungs, which indicated to the coroner that he wasn't breathing at the time that he threw up. And also, when he was found, he was face down, which allows any liquid that's around your face to flow away from your body. So on his death certificate, the final cause of death is listed as pneumonia, which the coroner did not originally agree with, but did sign off when presented. The, uh, the theory of pneumonia is not widely accepted by those close to the case. We'll probably never know how an experienced outdoorsman that was in great physical shape, how he was lost in the woods and eluded rescuers for two days, ultimately to be found dead well within the search radius and no reasonable cause of death would be available. I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. On Monday, August 3rd, a 27-year-old man named Michael was getting ready to visit friends at the Hobo Campground in Dorena, Oregon. It would be a nice break for Michael to get away from Eugene, where he was originally from. He was working there at a bar and grill. Before setting out for the road trip though, he decided to make a small detour and go to visit his family, his mom and dad, in Harrisburg, Oregon. While there, he caught up with his parents on the things that were going on in their lives, and he would also go on to tell them what his plans were for that week. Uh, he told them that he was going to ride down to the campground with one of his mutual friends, and they were gonna spend the week there at a birthday party slash camping trip, and it would actually turn out to be a rave. So after visiting, he would say goodbye to his parents and set out with his friend to the campground. Campground was about 50 miles to the south. Uh, unbeknownst to everybody involved, it would be the last time that the mother, father, and son would all see each other alive. To give you an idea of what the area that Michael was going to was like, the Hobo Campground is located in the Umpquai National Forest, and the location for the party was a very primitive campsite, so that means it didn't have water or restrooms or other amenities that you would normally find at campgrounds. Many times people, if they needed to use the restroom or something like that, they would just step into the woods and find a convenient location. Uh, there was also a path from the campsite that led down to a fairly wide, large creek, but it was very shallow. And when Michael got to the campground, they found that there was already about 50 people there. They had multiple buses. They had a DJ booth set up and music was being played and music was Michael's passion. So on multiple occasions throughout August 3rd and 4th, he would be invited on stage to perform different songs that he knew. And many of those in attendance would admit to seeing Michael on stage. Many of these party goers would continue to party throughout the night and from the 4th to the 5th, that's exactly what they did. The party would go on all the way up through 4.30 in the morning when uh, somebody recalls seeing Michael step out of one of the party buses and then he went to the woods and his friends recalled thinking that maybe he had to relieve himself. But Michael never came back out of the woods and his friends do recall that he didn't bring any hiking equipment with him. Um, they tried to call him but his phone was already dead. They didn't really know where he was at or where he was going. At the time though, when the friends saw Michael step into the woods, they didn't think that there was anything nefarious or ill will planned. They just thought Michael was stepping away from the party. 
and it wouldn't be until the following day at 5 p.m., more than 12 hours later, before somebody would report that Michael is gone. His parents immediately drove down to the area. His father, Parrish, stepped out of the car, and when he did, he felt very sick. He knew that something was wrong. He knew that something bad had happened to his son, and the people from the party didn't seem like they were helping much. They were kind of sitting around and eating and drinking and laughing. There was a search going on, and they weren't involved. By the time his family showed up, the rescuers were already on site and they had hundreds of people from the surrounding area helping to look for where Michael had gone. They had drones and horses and they were covering some of the unforgiving terrain to see if there are any trails or tracks, clothing, broken branches, something that would tell them where Michael went. But after more than 700 hours of searching was logged, and 19 days later, they weren't able to find any trace of Michael, not a footstep, not a piece of clothing, nothing was found, and they eventually called off the official search. Four months after Michael disappeared, his father would receive a phone call, and the phone call said that there's something that they found on Bryce Creek Road, which was about a mile west of the campsite that they were staying at. When local police arrived to the location, they taped off the, the area and they found that there was a pile of clothes belonging to Michael, but there were a few problems with it. The area that the clothes were found in was in an area that had been searched many, many times. It was within a mile of the campsite. So people had walked this area at least four times. And also the clothes were in an area where there's a road close by and you could look off that road and see those clothes very visibly. The general consensus amongst investigators was that the clothes were planted in that location by somebody that knew what happened to Michael. It's unknown if Michael was under the influence of any substances or possibly lost his way in the woods or maybe there was even foul play. Um, if you were in the Dorena, Oregon area in early August 2020 and you saw anything or know anything, please contact the authorities. Also, as always, please post down in the comments what you think happened to Michael. Thank you everyone that stayed this far and hopefully you enjoyed today's stories. If you did, don't forget to hit the like button below, the subscribe button, and do that bell thingy. Also, I post daily short stories on TikTok. You can follow me at Mr. No Sleep TV. Again, thank you for all your support and until next time, see ya.